Hi, in this video we are going to discuss about decerebrate and decorticate rigidity. So this can be asked as a short essay of 8 marks. So we will just see what to write when such a question is asked. So in the introduction we can start about writing how a normal posture is maintained. See why are we writing about posture in the introduction? Actually, decorticate and decerebrate rigidity are specific involuntary postures a person assumes when he's got a lesion in his brainstem. So that is why in the introduction we are writing what, what the normal is or how a normal posture is actually maintained. So we know that posture is uh, maintained by an integration of different postural reflexes. And that is it occurs at various levels of the central nervous system right from the spinal cord to the cortex. Okay. So posture is an integration of postural reflexes and so in the introduction you can write in general about how a normal posture is maintained. Right. Then we can move on to the definition of decerebrate and decorticate rigidity. So first the de definition of decerebrate rigidity. So it is a term that describes involuntary extensor positioning of the arms, flexion of hands and knee extension and plantar flexion usually as a result of damage to the lower midbrain and upper pons okay so if the lesion is in the lower midbrain the person will be in a almost fully extended form so how will we memorize this see in the term decerbit we've got a lot of ease here right so whenever you see a lot of ease remember that the person is in an extended position okay so like that you can memorize that in decerebrate the person will be in a fully extended position right and the damage is to the lower midbrain what about decorticate? Decorticate rigidity is a term that describes involuntary flexor positioning of the arms. So he, see here the major differences in the position of the arms. In the other one it was extended and here it is flexed. Uh, the knee is as usual in extension and that is plantar flexion and the damage is in the upper midbrain. So decorticate is when there is damage in the upper midbrain. Right? Now we will see the pathophysiology. So before moving on to pathophysiology, we should know what is the normal physiology of posture, right? So posture is maintained mainly by anti-gravity muscles. So which are anti-gravity muscles? It is usually the flexors of the upper limb and the extensors of the lower limb. These are our anti-gravity muscles. So we should first know how the tone is maintained in this group of muscle, right? So normally we've got from the cortex, we've got the corticoreticular fibers which act on two different areas of the reticular formation. One is the excitatory reticular formation of the pons and other is the inhibitory reticular formation of the medulla. See, so we've got two centers in which one is excitatory and one is inhibitory. So this excitatory reticular formation in the pons is actually self-excited. It doesn't need anybody's help to be excited. But this inhibitory area of the reticular formation needs constant support from the cortex. Okay, only then this will be activated. Now these two uh, fibers from the reticular formation, they actually synapse onto the extensor gamma motor neuron, right? And this extensor gamma motor neuron in turn innervates our muscle spindle of the extensor muscle. See here, so when this is stimulated, what happens? It will stimulate this extensor gamma motor neuron, which in turn will stimulate this muscle spindle. So this via the gamma loop will indirectly activate the alpha muscle group also. Okay, so there will be a constant tone present in this extensor group of muscles, right? Now we have also got the corticospinal tract which in turn innervates the flexor motor neurons, right? So this is the flexor muscle and the corticospinal tract will in turn innervate the flexor muscle group, okay? Now this is also supported by our rubrospinal tract. See from the red nucleus we have got this rubrospinal tract which in turn innervates this flexor alpha motor neuron. So there will be a constant activation of this flexor muscles, right? So see, you, you can see that the extensor muscles are constantly under, under the control of this reticular form, formation uh, fibers and the flexor muscles are under the constant influence of the corticospinal and the rubrospinal fibers. So this is the basic physiology. Now we will see what happens when there is a decortical or decerebrate rigidity. So, in decerebrate rigidity, the lesion is either, we said that it is in the lower midbrain, right? So, here you can see that it is at this level, which means it is below the red nucleus. So, what will happen? 
will there be activation of the inhibitory inhibitory fibers from the cortex no right so that will be cut off right and also so because the cortex is cut off the its uh, support to the in inhibitory reticular formation will be cut off so that will also not work so finally here you can see that there is a dominance of the impulses which are coming from the excitatory reticular formation of the pons right so that is why we get a more extended pattern in case of the decerebrate rigidity here you can see that it is fully extension that is because they've got a dominance of this excitatory reticular formation of pons because the cortex is cut the its support to the inhibitory reticular formation is cut off because the red nucleus is cut off the rubrospinal and also the corticospinal influence on the flexor motor no neurons is also cut off so that is why we get an extended position in case of a decerebrate rigidity right so when you write that answer you can write it like this there is interruption of all inputs from the cortex that is corticospinal as well as corticobulbar and red nucleus primarily to the distal muscles of the extremities the excitatory and inhibitory reticular spinal tract remain intact but see what is the problem with the inhibitory reticular spinal tract it is not receiving the support from the cortex right so there will be a dominance of the excitatory reticular spinal pathway which leads to hyperactivity in the extensor muscles on all four limbs that is why we have got an extended posture in case of decerebrate rigidity right now we'll see about decorticate in decorticate rigidity the lesion is in the upper midbrain which means the red nucleus is actually spared which means the rubrospinal tract is spared right so here again because the cortex is cut off we have the uh, inhibitory area of the reticular formation of the medulla cut off and also uh, the corticospinal tract is also cut off but the advantage here is that the rubrospinal tract is intact so that is why here to the extensors we've got the support of this excited reticular formation of the pons which is self excitatory and for the flexor muscles we've got this rubrospinal tract which stimulates the flexors so that is why we've got a flexed posture in case of a decorticate rigidity we've got a flexion of the upper limbs because of this rubrospinal tract okay so when you write the answer you can write like this decorticate rigidity is characterized by the flexion of the upper extremities at the elbow and extensor hyperactivity in the lower extremities the flexion is explained by the rubrospinal excitation of the flexor muscles in the upper extremities and the hyperextension is due to same as that of decerebration the extension here the cause of the extension of the lower limbs is same as that of the decerebrate rigidity but the flexion is explained by the rubrospinal okay now for some additional scoring points you can write about the experimental evidence or how these posture regulating mechanisms were actually studied see for that what they did was they took an animal and then they transected at different levels to find out the role of different levels of the cns to control posture so based on the level of transection we gave it each a name right so suppose this is the brain stem in the first group of animals what they did was they had they transected it below the level of the medulla and they called such an animal as spinal animal okay so it is like that they studied all the spinal cord uh, role in integration of postural reflexes in the next type of animal they cut between the pons and the midbrain or in the upper pons and they called such an animal as a decerebrate animal because its posture was similar to that of our i mean uh, the decerebrate rigidity is called so because the posture is similar to that of a decerebrate animal right and finally they cut at the level of the above the midbrain midbrain the upper midbrain so that that animal was called the decorticate animal because in such an animal the cortex was cut off okay and only the brain stem was intact so this is the, this is how they studied the different integration of posture at different levels okay so it is good that you can include if you include this answer into your uh, this uh, this part into your answer paper so now we'll see some applied aspects so a lesion that produces a decerebrate type of rigidity is an uncle herniation due to supratentorial lesion so whenever there is uncle herniation uh, you can see a decerebrate type of lesion 
and the cause of a decorticate rigidity it is usually seen on the hemiplegic side after hemorrhages or thrombosis in the internal capsule so see after when you get a lesion in the internal capsule like a hemorrhage or a thrombosis it is usually seen that on that hemiplegic side we get a decorticate type of rigidity okay so by that we can complete that answer so if such a question is asked for the exam you can write about the introduction in which you will write about the different postures then you can write about the experimental evidence the spinal animal the decorticate and decerebrate animal then the definition of decorticate and decerebrate rigidity the pathophysiology wherein you can draw the diagram and also the applied aspects okay so i hope the concept is clear thank you